Good evening. Thank you for joining with people from across the country and around the world as we learn more about the Synod for the Amazon one year later, new paths for the church in Latin America and Canada. We begin with acknowledging the traditional lands on which Queen's House resides. I acknowledge that the land on which Queen's House was built is Treaty 6 territory, the traditional lands of the Cree, Salto, Stony, Nakoda, Dakota, and Lakota, and the homeland of the Métis. We are dedicated to ensuring that the spirit of reconciliation and Treaty 6 is honored and respected. My name is Sarah Donnelly. I'm the program director at Queen's House Retreat and Renewal Center in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan, and I am your Zoom host this evening. Tonight's gathering will include learning from our three guest speakers, participating in small group discussions in breakout rooms, and then bringing our questions and comments to our guest speakers in a large group discussion at the end of the evening. It's our hope that the formal part of this process will end at 8.30 p.m. Saskatchewan time, but I will keep the Zoom link open for as long as people wish to speak with each other and visit. Um, we were doing that a little bit before this recording began. Um, so please feel free to stay and linger and connect with each other as you wish. I want to thank the planning committee who have worked very hard over these last few months in planning for this event and the additional webinar that will be offered before the summer. Members of this committee include Joe Gunn, Myron Rogel, Chris Harenku, Father Ken Forrester, Harry LaFond, Louise, and Brendan Bitts. Our moderator for this event is Chris Harenku from the Center for Peace, Reason, Faith, and Justice at St. Thomas More College here at the University of Saskatchewan and Chris will be introducing our three guest speakers shortly. But first, let us take some time to quiet and to center ourselves. Tobacco has been offered to Elder A.J. Felix of Sturgeon Lake First Nation as he leads us in an opening prayer as we open this time together in a good way. So Mr. Felix, we'll pass it over to you. Good evening. Krakio, that means everyone. That's Cree. I'm a uh, Cree elder, used to be a leader. Uh, I'm a Treaty 6 helper, or Uskapios. Uskapios means helper. And I'm the Treaty, Treaty 6 pipe keeper for the territory. And I'm also uh, a little bit beyond that. I'm also the the bundle keeper, the pipe keeper, the fire keeper of treaties one to 11. That's right across uh, most of the Great Lakes coming over to the Rocky Mountains and into the, uh, uh, into the Northwest Territories. I'm the uh, treaty one to 11 uh, uh, sacred bundle keeper. And I'm the one that uh, introduces uh, gatherings of treaties 1 to 11, uh, which we hold pretty well annually in different parts of the country. We have 11 crown treaties across Canada, and I have been designated as the fire keeper along with my wife. My wife is the co fire keeper. Uh, she, uh, as you know, a fire could not, you could not keep a fire burning without a man and without a woman. It takes a man and a woman to keep a fire going. So I wanted to uh, start by introducing myself that way. Uh, I, also, uh, I also am an elder for St. Thomas More College. I'm a Catholic. I'm a, I, I, we've, uh, I'm a residential school survivor of uh, 13 years. My wife is 10 years. And uh, we came through it pretty rough, came out of it, and uh, we had our issues with the church, but we uh, got over those issues and uh, seen that we seen God above the issues. God is still good. 
even though maybe we we might have been hurt in many ways. God is still our Lord and our Savior. I also, uh, we also know, we also know and have, a, a, although we're traditional people, we do traditional ceremonies, we do traditional uh, uh, special rituals and events. Uh, we're, we're, we're holders of several uh, uh, fire, uh, fire and uh, ceremonial lodges. Uh, we're holders of those. We've been keepers of those. Uh, but we're also good Catholics. We're into, into uh, summer camps. We're into uh, those uh, annual gatherings. Uh, we bring our children over there and uh, we enjoy. We receive the Eucharist. And we're our church burnt down in our reservation. Uh, we have midnight mass in our home, and we crowd up our little home with uh, and uh, sing those beautiful sacred songs. Uh, and and it's a, it's a, it's a beautiful singing group. We sing the Silent Night or Joy to the World, like you've never heard it before even harmonized we have a singing family so we we that's where i'm coming from i'm coming from a, a family that uh, came through rough times parents that were alcoholics they had been residential school survivors us marrying into alcohol alcohol and hard time violence but coming out of it in a in a it, it was a it was hard but coming out and raising a family of 11 children and having over 70 grandchildren great grandchildren over 70 and having had having uh, celebrated 54 years of marriage so that's where I'm coming from. I'm, I'm, I pride myself to be a great a grandpa and a great grandpa and a husband and a keeper of a fireplace. This fireplace that we talk about is our little home. We got to keep our fireplace uh, in a good way. We have to teach our, teach our little babies and grandchildren playing around that fireplace, keep the good word. Don't yell, don't swear, and keep that fireplace free of uh, any alcohol, drugs, cannabis. Keep your fireplace in a good way, and your fireplace will continue to burn brightly warmly and uh, it'll be healthy your fireplace and from your fireplace we'll walk out well respectful young people your sons and your daughters they will walk out of your fireplace to go and start their own fireplace with a good mind with a spiritual mind and uh, praying people and they will in turn go and light up a fireplace and they will be able to to uh, have that fireplace that will fire that will burn for many many years and even from generation to generation i want to welcome you all to a uh, treaty six territory this is the ancestral lands of uh, our ancient people this, this is the land where we, we hear stories, generational stories of many wonderful and good people. We hold many stories. We hold many stories of life. We heard many, many life-giving songs. 
we heard many life-giving stories on how even how even you can you can turn from uh, sickness to health or from trauma to healing we've been through it i know in my in my 75 years of life when i stopped to consider where we've been my grandpa's my dad mom and then me in the 75 years of my life i know that we have been when i say when i say tragic traumatic i think we've seen it all in my generation but i'm glad to be here with you and to share to share the uh the problems to share the hurts of peoples on the other side of the world yes we share that we share we share the hurt we share the neglect we share the uh we watch we watch uh uh processes and developments go by just watching not being a part of anything really and uh living in poverty most most of the way not being not being uh not being the uh, uh the uh shareholders the revenue sharing nothing mostly the isolated reserved type of life but we're coming through it and we're coming out of it and i'm glad that the many many folks are concerned as to what is happening in the amazon what is happening to their uh, resources what is happening to their lives what is happening to their uh, spirituality their language what is happening to their family their family uh, break breakdown and the family violence that they are now living in trying to 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 trying to feel a little better bit better by turning into towards alcohol towards drugs we know what is happening in the amazon and i know because history keeps repeating itself so with that i'm going to ask the creator lord god jesus is also a special a special person in our lives jesus and his mother mary my understanding is that there is a tribe of people across the ocean it's a tribe and a simple peasant little girl was handpicked by the creator lord god to bear a man a earth spirit man endowed with the power of the great spirit we honor him if he was born on earth like me born of a lowly peasant girl like my mom that i most certainly can relate my brotherhood to that man they call him jesus <laughs> so with that i'm going to pray heavenly father lord god we want to thank you for this opportunity this evening where we got we gather our minds and our spirits heavenly father to our fellow man our fellow man that's hurting our fellow man that's that's been the, the protector and the, and the uh, host of a paradise called amazon we lord god have seen that vision 
of that paradise here in North America. And we appreciate our relationship with the creation that you have provided for us. We, pre we appreciate that you created everything for our survival. We appreciate that you've made, you've made us understand that we are family to your creation. So with that, Lord God, help this uh, webinar, this Zoom meeting tonight, so that we across the land can uh, save our home. So that we don't, we don't take, uh, so that we don't have to uh, destroy what we have. Protect us, Heavenly Father, Lord God, because that's this, this is the only home we have. This is the only home we have, and uh, we're destroying it. We're destroying it by uh, overtaking, by polluting by uh, emissions. That's how we're destroying our home. So bless these people that have, that are able to voice their concerns in a real way. Bless the church, Heavenly Father, Lord God. We want to continue to bring our children into a church that will teach them good things that will teach them the right way, that will teach them to love and to trust. When we practice justi justice and honest honesty for our peoples, I say that in the spirit world's name, the spirit, the spirit's name, the angels, and I say that in Jesus' name, Amen. 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 Thank you, Mr. Felix. Uh, I'm going to now turn it over to you, Chris, uh, as you moderate this gathering. Thank you, AJ, and thank you, Sarah. Um, so I'm Chris Ferenko, and I'm very honored to be serving as the founding director uh, for the Center for Faith, Reason, Peace, and Justice at St. Thomas More College. Tonight, I'm also going to be your moderator. Um, but just before we begin, I've been asked um, to just ask you to keep our colleague, um, Deacon Harry Lafond, in your prayers. Uh, Harry's been a driving force on our organizing committee, and he had a cardiac event um, and is waiting awaiting surgery. Uh, he reports having an ache in the heart, but being strong in the head. And I ask you to join me in wishing him a shift to a return to his robust self. So in terms of this evening, I'm delighted to introduce our three uh, speakers in the order which they will present. First, we have Mauricio Lopez Oropiza. Uh, he's the former executive secretary and co-founder of REPAM, which is the ecclesiastical Ecclesial, pardon me, Pan-Amazon network that animated over 85,000 people in discussions as preparation for the Synod on the Amazon. Mauricio was the executive director of pastoral and social ministries at Caritas Ecuador. Currently, he's the interim executive secretary of the Ecclesial Conference of the Amazon and, and a staffer for the Center for Pastoral Action of CELAM, the Council of Latin American Bishops. Pope Francis named Mauricio as the, to the Preparatory Council for the Synod, and he attended the event as a non-voting member while serving as part of the Synod's Information Commission. After Mauricio speaks, we'll hear from Mariangel Marco Tija. Uh, she was born in Asturias, Spain. Uh, she has a degree in geography and history, and she is a vowed member of the Congregation of the Ursulines of Jesus. From September, 2013 until April 2019, she lived as a missionary in Ecuador, where she joined REPAM, which is the Pan American Ecclesial Network. There, she uh, accompanied people of Tudaymane, a town in the Ecuadorian Amazon affected by the implementation of an open pit mine, 
Currently, she, minis she ministers as program coordinator at Star of the North Retreat House in Edmonton. And last, we'll hear from Marie Chatlin, uh, who is originally from Saskatoon. He was named as Bishop of Mackenzie Fort Smith in 2007 and installed as Archbishop of Kuwait and Lepa on the same day as the inauguration of Pope Francis in Rome on, in 2013. He serves as co-chair co of the Our Lady of Guadalupe Circle, the Catholic Church's Coalition for Advancing Reconciliation with Indigenous Peoples in Canada. So without further ado, over to Mauricio. Thank you very much, Chris. Uh, it is a pleasure to be here with you tonight. I'm very grateful to have a chance to speak after our elder, Felix. I'd like to start by sharing uh, my screen just for a moment with an image which touches my heart very deeply. The hands of a mother, God our mother, our sister mother earth, caring hands, but hands that are also tired, worn out for keeping our life and asking for us to be co-creators. And then I want to echo the voices of the Maya people in Central America in this reflection, which I think is very connected to what drove the process of the Synod in the Amazon and which connects us, all of us, members of one human family. And it says, they took our fruits, they cut our branches, they burned our trunks, but they could not kill our roots. As I was listening to our elder Felix talking about his role and mission as a fire keeper, I could not help but also connect to something that was very much present in our discernment in the Senate. And it's the image of Moses in front of the firing bush when God calls him. And when he approaches, he says, stop right here take off your sandals because the land, the soil that you're stepping on is sacred land. The lives of the indigenous communities are in heritage coming from them and the intention of the Senate and the Catholic Church with its sense and its lights is part of that reflection in terms of the sacred soil that we want to embrace in this process. So, so I want to also share with you three very short anecdotes which marked and touched my heart very deeply in the preparation of the Senate. I had a privilege to be part of the preparatory uh, commission and while I was there, uh, one day the Pope, he was part of it, approached us. I was there with Father Peter Hughes, a very beloved Columban priest, and the Pope told us please pay attention to the most important. The peripheries become the center. So this kept echoing my heart. What does that mean? What was once considered something that we can throw away or discardable now becomes the cornerstone of this redemption and conversion process. This was at the very core of the process of the Senate. It was never only about the Amazon, but of course it had to respond to the challenges of the Amazon. But it was about the light, the spirituality, the possibility for a future coming from the periphery to help the center to be transformed. You could feel it and you could sense it. It was not something that the Pope wanted just to enrich the reflection, but to actually help him change the dynamic of a very European Western type of church, which has been part of our history, but one which needs to be more Catholic in terms of universal, and it needs to be more embracing of diversity. The second uh, memory that I have at a meeting with Cardinal Humes and Cardinal Barreto and myself, the three of, all, of us with the Pope, he insisted many times, do not lose focus of this synod. It has to be about the Amazon peoples. It has to be about what's happening there. Do not let all of the other issues 
important, of course, for the Catholic Church take over, as it happened in many cases with media and others, and trying to take away the identity of this synod, which was, yes, of course, for the universal church, but about the peoples there, their sufferings, their hopes, their cries, and their songs, which needed to be recognized and embraced by the center. And the third element, something that the Pope has been using as a category in the past uh, months or years, and this is the overflowing dynamic. And I'm going to quote the Pope directly during the Synod, when we felt that we were missing the centerpiece of the process, he came to us very passionately and said, we have not finished making total proposals. The proposals are patchwork proposals. There is no totalizing solution that responds to the totalizing unity of the conflict. With patches, we cannot solve the Amazonian problems. They can only be solved by overflow. God solves conflicts by overflow. This also connects me with Felix's mention of God is above the issues. But this is an overflowing dynamic, which we hope it will continue to enlighten, enlighten, enlighten the reflection of the church in the future. I then remember one of my first experiences with the Amazonian uh, indigenous peoples, with the Sarayaku people. And I remember the story, an elder called Sabino from that Sarayaku people told us, he participated in the lawsuit of his traditional people against the Ecuadorian state of the Inter-American Court for Human Rights due to the absence of a consultation process for an oil extraction prospection in their territory. They destroyed part of their lands and they left hundreds of dynamite loads in their cultural territory. He was asked to participate as part of the juridical procedures and he was asked what was the hardest impact of this violation of their cultural and territorial rights for the Sarayaku people. And with evident sorrow in his eyes, he responded, undoubtedly, the most tragic impact has been the destruction of a sacred field, causing the abandonment of more than half of the spirits of wisdom of our ancestors who will never be able to come back. They say that the other elder wise of these people, the Sarayaku people, cried for three days on top of the tree of wisdom, which, which was cut down by the Petroleum Corporation. He died of sadness three months later. So this is really at the center of the intention of the sinners of the Amazon to bring the peripheries in terms of the enlightening, a dynamic of a world that is fractured, that is broken. Three key elements of the synod, which I feel are for us lessons to continue to deepen are, first of them, interculturality as a pastoral category. It's no longer an anthropological category. It is part of our dynamic as Catholic Church to find ways to interact and respect the diverse spiritualities of the indigenous peoples, to embrace the, those and go together into a new pathway of uh, sharing our identities. A second element was calling the Amazon as a locus, which in theology uh, means a sacred place. So many people against the Synod, against the Pope, against Laudato Si, this was a sin. Making something which is not the center a sacred place. But this is what it is as we reflected on in our opening prayer, it is the recognition of God's uh, capacity to be present everywhere. Otherwise, we are making God into our own image, and that's reducing him. And the third element is territoriality, acknowledging the dynamic of territories which are connected in social sciences, in, the, in biological sciences, we call the Amazon a territory or a biome a living system which is connected. The indigenous peoples have always understood this and they've known it for so long, but we created these ideas of uh, uh, nation states which broke and divided something which is actually connected. 
So the church is trying to also embrace that, that, that dynamic. And it's not only happening in the Amazon. We are accompanying, and I have the privilege to be a part of, of that process. We are accompanying different dynamics similar to the territorial approach in Repam and the Amazon Synod in the Congo Basin, in the Asia and Oceania region, in the Mesoamerican region, in the southern part of our continent with the Great Chaco and the Guarani Aquifer. In North America, this is where uh, Bishop Bolin has been participating with us and also in Europe. So there is something emerging, a new ecclesiological perspective which includes Laudato Si and integral ecology, but also those other elements that I've already mentioned. So as it was mentioned, we had the privilege to help uh, bring a bridge for about 80,000 people to participate in the process, uh, out of which about uh, 5,000 people representing indigenous communities from more than 170 nationalities who had a chance to speak, to share their vision. And we brought that into the Amazon uh, Synod Assembly, where we had for the first time about 25 indigenous peoples, men and women from different countries sharing their own vision, participating just like anybody else. Of course, the structure of that uh, uh, institution of the church would not allow for them, or even myself as a layman, to, to vote, but we were part of the process. I want to offer you two of the dreams of Querida Amazonia, which Pope Francis offered us, but those come from the voices of the peoples themselves. And he says, I dream of an Amazon region that can preserve its, its distinctive cultural riches, where the beauty of our humanity shines forth in so many varied ways. I dream of an Amazon region that can jealously preserve its overwhelming natural beauty and the superabundant life he needs in its rivers and forests. A final word in, in my last minute, I want to offer you some key lessons that we've drawn from this experience and we are trying to maintain as part of the process. A first element which was part of the transforming dynamic was metanoia, which in our Catholic tradition means a radical conversion of the heart, a conversion both personal and communal, which connects to the vision of many indigenous peoples in the Amazon on the new birth of the person, the new birth of the planet. If we don't change our inner being first, nothing of what we do will be enough in the midst of this climate crisis. Indigenous peoples can help us change our hearts. The second element is authority, otherness, which means the, the only way in which we can find meaning in life is through the others. And for the indigenous peoples, this is connected to gratuity and reciprocity as a relationship with one another, but also with our territory, with our sister mother earth and with our creator. And the third element is parresia, also part of our, our Catholic tradition, which is the prophetic voice to speaking out, to go forth, to try to transform reality and to commit with reality. For the indigenous peoples in the Amazon, some of them call it to make the world done, to be there for us to enlighten our way. Of course, I have so many other things that I will want to share with you, but um, respecting the time, I will leave it for the uh, dialogue afterwards. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mauricio. I was just going to say that we will have a chance in the dialogue afterwards to take those up. So over to Marie Angel. I think you may be muted. Sorry. María Ángel, no te escuchamos todavía. Creo que tu micrófono está cerrado. Sorry. 
All the quotations that I will show um, come from uh, the final document of the Amazon Synod uh, from Querida Amazonia. So the Amazon Synod was a universal synod from the whole church, from a specific territory. Since diversity is the expression of God's self-focusing, our gaze on a specific territory is a way of approaching the incarnate, territorialized God. Everything that the church has to offer must become incarnate. The whole process of listening to the people in which about 7,000 people participated showed the attitude of the church allowing itself to be accompanied by the indigenous people. Later, the final document of the Amazon Synod confirmed this attitude and will, speaking about the spirituality of listening and proclamation. It was urgent for the church to pay attention and to be enriched by this territory. Scientists warn that the death of the Amazon will occur in 30 years if we cut off its own resilience. Querida Amazonia expresses the fear that we are finally heading for a biome on which the planetary balance depends. Mm -hmm. The Amazon is a theological place. God expresses God's self in the exuberance of its beauty, but also in the cross of the exploitation it suffers. In Querida Amazonia, the Pope invites us to contemplate the Amazon and not just analyze it, to make it our own and discover it as a theological place. Everything changes when something hurts us as our own. The Synod reminded us of the unestimable value of indigenous peoples. Those who are considered by many to be a hindrance to progress were recognized by the Church as people with an unvaluable knowledge of life, of contact with nature and its mysteries and of spiritual knowledge. The Pope expressly thanks them. The value of the world revealed to the native peoples of the Creator God by the Creator God, who has guided them for millennia, was recognized. Focusing on the theme of women, we will begin by stating that 35 women participated in the Synod the largest number ever in a synod. Not one had the right to vote, but they left their mark. We will go over what the final document of the synod states about women. Especially important is the affirmation, the ancestral wisdom of the Aboriginal peoples affirms that Mother Earth has a feminine face. How much we need to rescue this underlying intuition, so linked to the motherly face of God to be rediscovered. It is urgent for the church in the Amazon to promote and confer ministries for men and women in an equitable manner. The basis cannot be other that equal baptismal dignity, which must be effective, not only theoretical. It is good news that the Amazon puts on its agenda as a matter of urgency that basic equality between men and women, which should be a priority and urgency for the whole universal church. The Synod spoke to about a more incisive female presence in the church and the participation in decision making. The Synod present synodality as the most genuine form of being church. Synodality is a constitutive dimension of the church. Synodality marks a style of living communion and participation in local churches 
that is characterized by respect for the dignity and equality of all the baptized. Synodality without women is not possible. And we will stop on the number 102 of the final document, which deserves to be examined carefully. Seeing the concrete suffering of women who are victims of physical, moral, and religious violence, including feminists, the church commits to defend their rights. This is an important statement to be made concrete. With respect to the physical violence against women, we cannot fail to mention that exploitative practices toward nature are an extension of partner of dominance among us. The oppression of women and the devastation of the planet are two reinforcing forms of violence. Nature is exploited because it is seen only as a resources to be used. Earth and women, both source of life, frequently they are used and abused. In the countries that constitute the Amazon, there is a great tolerance of, for violence against women. As my sister in the Amazon say, male chauvinism has become naturalized, normalized, with its tragic and everyday consequences. Violence on a moral level is manifested in ecclesiastical discourses still in force that invite, for instance, to endure mistreatment because it is the cross that God has given you. A discourse publicly denounced by some bishop. We must not forget that invisibility is part of the breeding ground of contempt, which leads to so many forms of violence against women. It is worth mentioning religious violence, which is very presumably at the root of many other forms of violence. Religious patriarchy is based on supposedly sacred masculinity, and by appealing to the manly character of God, turns man into the only representative and spokesman of the divinity. Seemingly, masculinity is positive, and everything else is dependent of this masculinity. Consequently, it seems that women are not worthy of representing God in many of the realities within the church. All the symbolic language of church rites conveys the message that God is male and our religious formation reinforces that belief. Genesis states, male and female God created them. In the image of God, they were created. Therefore, men and women can make God transparent in this space-time in which we are allowed to live. The overrepresentation of men in the church is an imbalance that distorts the image of God. A theological discourse that is not liberating is meaningless. A theology that does not collaborate in the liberation of women does not come from God. The church will not be credible without a firm and practical position condemning violence against women. Returning to the final document of the Amazon Synod, it continues. Women are recognized as protagonists and guardians of creation and of the common home. This statement is so true and so evident in the Amazon. We recognize the ministry that Jesus reserved for women. There was also a request to reopen the dialogue of the women's diaconate. The reality is that women in the Amazon Synod argued from real practice, requesting services that are officially denied to, denied to them, but which they exercise. 
women are the first in the service diaconia, although later, officially, they are excluded from the diaconia of the world. This is not in line with the gospel. The great announcement of Christianity is the resurrection, and the first witnesses to whom Jesus entrusted the message were women. The reality is that women exercise the services without official recognition. As Sister Alba Teresa Cediel said in the Synod, the female diaconate, whether recognized or not, is being lived out. In the final speech, the Pope acknowledged that what was said about women at the Synod fell short and invited the overflow. Life is always ahead of us. It is by doing, by serving, the new path are born. The women are there. 70% of pastoral action in the Amazon is carried out by women. Within RIPAM, a group of women reflect on their ministries. And that is a source of life, because reflection should not be abstract, but incarnated, inculturated. The reality points to the importance of ministerial teams capable of inculturating themselves in different contexts for a specific time with instituted ministries. As Pope Francis has said more than once, tradition is the safeguard of the future, not the custodian of the asses. In Querida Amazonia, the Pope, recognizing the existence of conflicts, invites us to overcome them by overflowing with creativity. To overflow implies not to remain on the usual limits. From Querida Amazonia, let us be fearless. Let us not clip the wings of the Holy Spirit. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, it was very, very rich. We've had two very rich um, reflections. I want to pass it over now to Archbishop Murray. Okay, well, I humbly join in here because uh, I'm grateful to Sister Maringal and uh, to Maurizio for just your experience and uh, wisdom there to share with us. I completely have little to offer about the Amazon and even the direct experience of the Synod, but uh, I can make some connections to Canada. And the American Synod, uh, I mean, the, um, the Amazon Synod uh, statements, the paths and the dreams that Pope Francis talked about definitely connect to Canada as well. And so a uh, basic part is that in Canada, we have the boreal forest, which is 12% of the carbon uh, stock of the, of the world. And uh, uh, the Indigenous people's presence, there's a lot of similarities. So I just want to kind of address some of that now. One of the pieces is that we've talked about uh, systemic racism uh, in some of the uh, uh, political scene at this time. So I want to quickly go through the, the uh, Indian Act uh, some of the amendments and just kind of it clearly to me shows how Canada does have systemic racism, uh, especially towards our Indigenous peoples in our history. So 1884, it was amended to prohibit traditional Indian ceremonies such as pot, latch, sun dance, sweat lodge and powwows. It prevented the passing down of many oral histories and values, the use of Native spirituality and its shaping of First Nations life. And so just to be aware uh, uh, that uh, banning going to mass or having a pilgrimage. Uh, these uh, was how strong that was that beginning. 1886 uh, could find Indians to their reserves. Uh, they had to get a pass from their Indian agent before they could leave the reserve for short periods of time. And that was never passed in Canadian law. It, but it was enforced as if it was until the 1940s. And so that's part of our history that many Canadians aren't aware of. 1906, the Indian Act was amended, making it possible to remove Indians from reserves near our towns with a population over 8,000. Again, the inconvenient Indian, uh, the location. 
and so part of our history. The Indian Act was amended banding, banning Indians from wearing traditional and ceremonial dress in public. Quebec has its debate about religious symbols, but this kind of early on uh, are, uh, are outlawing that. Residential schools, 1920, became mandatory from the ages of 7 to 15, and again, removed the right of First Nations people to raise their own children, and it wreaked havoc on family structure with long-term consequences. 1920, the Indian Act amended to which made it an offense to hire lawyers and seek legal counsel, uh, and it was expanded to prohibit organizing and gathering just um, again boxing in the people and uh, trying to respond to situations. 1927 the Indian Act was amended making it illegal for Indians to solicit or raise funds for the purpose of filing land claims. So I think it just uh, is a nice succinct way to demonstrate that we have a very systemic racist system in Canada that was built on uh, creating assimilation. Uh, with the uh, calls to action that uh, the Guadalupe Circle is really uh, created for, um, so it's, I think that one of the pieces I really want to uh, look at is the, the sense of culture. And uh, so the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, as we mentioned, uh, it was a very important uh, statement, which the Canadian government has been very slow to adopt, to reply to, and continues to, to be in debate. And so uh, a lot, we're trying to encourage um, the, uh, an appropriate adoption of the uh, United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, uh, not just um, sort of in words or so that we can say we did it, but that it truly looks at a healthy moving forward with uh, reasonable consultation and uh, uh, really relying on some of the Indigenous peoples' awareness of the what's best for the land in their area. I was wanting to say just how important culture is that uh, one of the ways I try to think of it is like musical instruments that in my mind culture is a musical instrument that plays the song of the gospel that it's instruments that bring their own particular beauty and tone and quality that uh, can play that song of the gospel. And so just that importance of having a variety of instruments. If we only have one instrument, it's not going to be much of an orchestra. And uh, so that just uh, that metaphor, you can't take it all the way, but uh, a sense of that understanding of culture, how important it is. I think one of the pieces, too, is that um, some people, I think, are tone deaf to the issues around culture. It's a bit like the mother fish trying to explain to her baby fish what water is. That maybe they've lived all their, most of their lives in the particular language and way of doing things, and they don't realize how they bring that expectation on other peoples. And uh, again, it can be experienced in a very harmful way, and people are not aware of their sort of cultural deafness. And so just that as a church, I think we got to try to find that way to be culturally appreciative, that we encourage the languages of our Indigenous peoples in all the ways that we can, that we find that ability to value. And uh, so I think that's an important challenge for us. Um, another piece of that is the Indigenous spirituality. And, you know, we've had the history of not uh, respecting very well the good things that are present in Indigenous spirituality. One of our mottos that we keep saying is that the first thing we do when we come to a different culture or faith or language is take off our shoes, lest we step on something holy, forgetting that God has been there long before us. And so just that appreciation that God has been with Indigenous peoples for a long time. In our church, there is positive gifts and experiences. And so we celebrate the, the good parts of our Catholic faith and our Indigenous peoples. Uh, but and again, uh, appreciating the particular uh, 
connection to the land, the water, the rock, how they ground us again and again on, on those important teachers. This is a little example of hopefully how we are moving forward in the present day. This is uh, Father um, Victor, and we're on the grounds of Wasagamak, Manitoba. And uh, that is Archbishop Albert Legat, many of you recognize from uh, Saskatoon and uh, Prince Albert Diocese. And uh, uh, he is followed behind him as Archbishop Richard Gagno. And the three of us have arrived to dance in a sun dance, to participate. I don't think bishops have danced in many sun dances in the history of Canada. Uh, so anyway, it, it's a little step that is just in that uh, authentic dialogue and appreciation of the, the spiritual gifts that we can learn from. And so uh, again, I just always encourage our people to be open to participating in some of the indigenous rights uh, to, uh, to again, learn and understand, deepen our understanding of the gifts that are there. The drum is just so important in very, I think, indigenous people across the world. And so that appreciation of that, uh, again, the, uh, the cultural uh, vestments are important um, to value that and have pride in that. I love the pride in the, the lay leaders, that's our Catholic lay leaders in, P in Pelican Narrows. And Father Hainer, the priest, is with us on this call. Ongoing education. So I think this continues to be a challenge to us as Catholic Church that we are still pretty ignorant, I think, of what real um, indigenous history and uh, uh, teachings and spirituality are about. And to have that openness and willingness to, uh, to really uh, deepen our understanding. And that's a long-term commitment. But I really think that that ongoing education of ourselves and, and our families and our parishes is a very big piece. This is just a particular example of the challenges of um, enculturation. I think this is a residential school in Fort Smith, which was one of the best residential schools in Canada. I think a lot of progressive efforts were done there, particularly because Father uh, Jean Pochat, an oblate, uh, was uh, a very strong vision leader. And uh, he empowered the students and really called them, uh, the students from the Northwest Territories, to know their giftedness and their call to leadership uh, in their communities. Danny Bea was one of those uh, students, and, uh, and most of his experience was very good. But he said, you know, one of the pieces they were teaching us to be so strong in these academic and, and other elements, but they didn't help us to appreciate the wisdom of our parents we were going back to. That it kind of created in us a bit of a disdain for the backwardness perceived of our ancestors. And I think that's, you know, it was not the intent of the school, but it was sort of the blindness that was part of um, the best efforts that were happening at the time there. And uh, just a reminder that, you know, uh, this enculturation work is really challenging and important. Um, there is, though, some provisions there that every culture is like a particular person. There's gifts and there's blind spots and there's weaknesses in culture. And so that uh, we're not sort of um, making a gospel of culture, but that it is, again, the, the instruments that, by which we play. Uh, Fratelli Tutti uh, is, uh, was one of the things that was really, um, uh, I think, important in it, talking about no cultural isolation, that it is important that cultures do not simply withdraw in order to try to preserve themselves, but that in a more confidence of who they are, they can make, uh, make efforts at authentic dialogue respectfully. I'll just finish with a few signs of hope that uh, one of the signs is um, something as, as like education funding, that for some reason in Canada, the uh, 
a student on the reserves was never funded as well as students in other uh, populations. And this left with the education systems being more fiscally challenged on our reserves. Only in, the, I think it's a year and a half ago now, the quality was met by the Manitoba government anyway. And that's a huge uh, improvement that the education commitment on the government to the reserves uh, is much more significant. Another, I think, sign of hope is the political engagement of our Indigenous peoples. We had more candidates who are Indigenous running for politics in the last five years than we've maybe had in history in Canada. And so I think that's a very positive sign of hope. Another piece is there's, a, uh, such as this book by Suzette Mathot, some very good writing from Indigenous men and women. And so she writes a book called Legacy. And I just want to quote from her part on healing. And she's trying to suggest this is sort of a recipe for healing for our, our people who, who have gone through a lot of trauma and generational trauma. And so she talks about um, to do, an individual must learn the skills that they did not learn in their childhood the ability to tolerate and regulate emotional experiences, modulate their hypervigilance, express what they think and feel, and establish caring relationships with other people. This requires the individual to construct identity, develop a sense of agency, build a coherent narrative, and develop the ability to ask for help from others. I think those are some very important pieces of how to encourage and foster healing and, and growth in our places of dialogue, our places of accompaniment. There's um, these dreams that I think uh, are shared by Pope Francis, the paths towards a, a greater uh, a serious, a church and community. They're very similar, I think, in Canada and in the Amazon. I think the Amazon is a more stark expression of it and extremes, but it's also present here. So maybe the more we learn here in Canada, the better help we can be. And the more we learn of how they're working at it in the Amazon can be a help for us locally too. Gracias. Thank you, Archbishop Murray. So now we're going to move into um, our small groups, and Sarah's going to tell us a little bit about what's going to be going on in those small groups. Um, in the spirit of the cultures of encounter and dialogue, um, we're given, we want to maintain the 20 minutes that we honored for those groups. Um, so I will try to be quiet so we can get to the actual dialogue and pass it over to Sarah. Okay, thank you very much. So uh, I do have you in small groups and each group is facilitated um, by a leader. Um, so those leaders, if you could please uh, send in chat to Chris uh, any questions or comments uh, that, uh, that your group has raised. Um, Chris is the only one on the call whose name is Chris so that he'll be easy to find. And uh, we'll see you all here back here in 20 minutes. Yeah, so maybe I'll just say while she's sending you off that what, one of our principal visions for this was that if you could work together to craft one question that you'd like to ask one or more of the panelists, that would be really helpful to us. And then I'll try to curate those questions. All right, welcome back. So I hope all the uh, panelists are still with us. Um, I'm just going to start with the question that was from my group. Um, if you were a group facilitator, if you could go into the chat right now and start typing your questions, and then I'll try to um curate those questions but i have a pretty i think uh provocative and interesting question to start out with um that's for all the presenters and we're hoping our group was hoping that all the presenters would answer it which is where are we um so we we noticed that the one of the themes of the synod that was uh got a lot of media attention was this this role of uh women's ordination and the women's diaconate and so there was a question of where are we um, right now regarding the women's diaconate and where ought we to be going regarding the women's diaconate? And who would like to start from amongst the panelists?
Uh, if no one wants to go, I can I can go, Chris, if that's okay. Um, so I think the first element that for me has been very important is that we we need to embrace this as a Kairos moment, which is the precise time, God's time. And this is not to avoid the urgent transformations that we very much need, but actually to be able to read it, to read the journey from a discerning perspective. And I think this really makes a, a difference. So I, uh, for us, we could tell that from what we listened in, in the territorial assemblies and what actually happened in the Synod, there was a serious way forward. There was certainly step forward. And I think that in the issue of, uh, of women, the Pope was provoking us to go further. But if I can be uh, also critical, this was my sense being part of the process. The listening dynamic was truly a discerning one because there could be the emergence of these uh, realities and this cry for, for community, for recognition of something that's already there. But when we enter the structure of the Catholic Church, the assembly, you could sense the polaris polarization of the process. We lost completely the discerning dynamic of it. It was two sides, small sides, fighting one another, trying to impose. One side did not want any change to happen, and they were protecting structures and, and, and really uh, opposing those changes. But I have to say that also on the other side, there was no sensitivity towards what was coming from the listening process on the territory. It became an ideological arena of dispute. And we lost, and we had a chance to talk to the Pope and said, if we bring it into that, and we have many people that I adore and I admire, bring it into the ideological arena, we will fail to provide the Pope with what he needs, which is uh, the ground to take the, step, the next step forward. So I, I have to, 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 to talk very openly about this. This was my, my perception. Uh, because I think the media did not help also in many ways because many European um, dynamics were pushed into the Senate. From my experience listening to the people on the ground, there was not too much of the married priests and this became the only issue that was discussed. It was not really there. People in the Amazon wanted to have a relevant presence of the church and ministries according to their reality. One of them could probably be eventually the married priest, priest, but there was some pressure from elsewhere. The women deacons part, that, that was a failure, as I explained. But at the same time, as Maria Angel was saying, the reality is so clear, so evident, that it's going to happen. We are working directly in the creation of new structures a unprecedented, an unprecedented structure called SEAMA, the Ecclesial Conference of the Amazon, in which one of the main issues is the creation of new ministries. But it's going to take some time. It cannot be a, a, a dispute on that field. It has to be about reality, and I'm certain that it's going to move forward. So I always ask people, Yes, it's true that did not move forward, but why don't you acknowledge something that it was there? People don't recognize the role of the women, of the woman uh, coordinator of community. It's a parish uh, 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 women coordinating the, the, that is there. The ministries also appointed to, to women to acknowledge what it's already true. Maybe we cannot change a few issues in the doctrine, but reality is so clear, so evident that the new ministries are emerging. And through the Synod, we could find other ways to go about that. And I know this was not the question, but women priesthood, I, I, I can tell you that most of the people on the ground never even thought about it, not because they don't think it's relevant, it was just not there. 
and my experience, I don't know Maria Angel's position on this, my experience with religious women working in the Amazon, they said, I do not wish to be that. I want to be part of a ministry which is truly connected to my heart. Being priest is probably not it. I need to be acknowledged, recognized, and embraced for what I am in the church. And we need to create ministries in terms of that. So when everything became married priests or women priests, we probably lost sight of what was really at the core of the discerning process. Thank you. I would like to, to add. Thank you, Mauricio. Well, um, if the fact that we are speaking about that is thanks to Pope Francis. So thank you. We are <laughs> really in a spring in the church. So we, we ought to, to, to think back and to say, oh, no, we are in a big spring in the church. So thank you. But well, we are in a structure that moves. <laughs> but for me, it's what I can do, and all of us, and all the bishops <laughs> and priests that are here too, no? because we can do too, no? well, for the diaconate, uh, well, there are a commission, uh, we say from the Amazon that the, the reflection ought to be incarnate, because abstractly finish as the last time for nothing, <laughs> so <laughs> to, to speak about nothing. So the ecclesiology is Vatican II. So that is the point. And we ought to recover and to do through the Vatican II. It's not. It's not. <laughs> so please put in action the Vatican II. And that is the beginning of the reflection. So key points, synodality. So Pope Francis, thank you. Is <laughs> put that word in, in a fashion way that is not easy to put in action because we do as normal things that are not normal. <laughs> so, our church say, and I say sadly from the experience they are here. In our church, the men are to be honored and the women are to be used. So arrive a priest and all is thank you for being here. You can work hard. Um, you are a name. So because you are a woman, so the normal thing is that women work without being named and we be recognized. So we are to be used, and that is our church here in the Amazon and everywhere, no? because it's normal, no? That is normal. Pues no, it's not normal. Can you imagine Jesus here in our church? What he is going to do if he's here? So I say in the little group, Jesus finished as he finished in a, in a cross because left the prudence to risk the justice, the price was so high, but we follow who? <laughs> well, in that way, to say, uh, nobody mentioned, but uh, the last month was the motu proprio of the um, Spiritus Dominus, no? <laughs> well, little step, no? The, the little step was, <laughs> the reality was other, so, but it was needed, the Synod asked to do that. But the Pope, in the letter who come with the motus proprio, encourage the, the, uh, the diocese to establish other ministries that they consider necessary. So at the end, <laughs> it's very hard to move the structure, but offer, the Pope normally offer ways. So I hope that the bishop <laughs> listen and to say, you are free, you are free to put more in action. Well, in, in, I remember a little finish um, when I, I arrived at, uh, here at Canada in April 2019. In June, was published the final report of the National Inquiry into Missing and Murdering Indigenous Women and Girls. I was traumatized. Eh? So, was it, that happened here? <laughs> the ideal image of Canada. Yes, and the conclusion of the big report, um, almost. 500 pages is that they were, um, they died because they were indigenous and they were women. So male chauvinism killed. Killed in physically and killed in the church because I cannot speak. So it seems that the men have the, um, only the, the Holy Spirit is for them. So all the, only then uh, can do the homily. And my passion for the word of God where, no? Pues no, 
you ought to be in silence because you have the, <laughs> the bad luck to be to bore women, no? to be a woman. Because that is not Holy Spirit, but of course the chair is going to, to move very slow. But don't wait for the structure to change. The, ch the changes came from the basis, not from the top. And the Pope said that several times. <laughs> uh -huh. hmm. I really appreciated Maurizio's uh, description of sort of this dynamic because I wasn't at the Synod and how sort of all this great synodality was happening and uh, voices from so many places. And then it gets into the kind of pattern of Rome and, uh, and it was ideology and division. And uh, so that it's a big challenge. The, um, I think people are chatting that uh, in the diocese I'm in, most of our lay leaders are women. And our priests are not in every community every Sunday by a long shot. So I would say there's more women leading liturgy in my diocese on a Sunday than men. So just the awareness that what you're seeing in parts of Canada isn't everywhere. Uh, now, is that accomplishing all we're supposed to accomplish? No, uh, we have may, very far to go. Uh, I just encourage the voices and, and you know, uh, the, and what's on your hearts to keep sharing that to all of us uh, because we will only hear the dissonance when others sometimes bring it to our attention. I talked about uh, a cultural tone um, uh, uh, and ability to hear the, the music and uh, and that can happen with gender too. So uh, so I just encourage, continue to bring forward the experience of um, the female part of the church. Thank you everyone. Um, so for the next question, I'd like to ask, um, how can we foster cross-cultural experiences and dialogue that are people-centered, both the experiences and the dialogue, um, that align with these four dreams that Pope Francis states at the end of the document? Do you want to change the order or we just... <laughs> sure. uh, okay. Um, so, for me, it was very powerful to, to experience concrete experiences. I am very much about experiences. That's what really changes your heart. So, one was uh, the beginning of the Synod. It's very important to acknowledge this. The Synod was not the assembly which took place in Rome on October 2019. The Synod was actually a whole process. And it started, of course, when the Pope announced it, but it actually started when the Pope went to Puerto Maldonado, to the Amazon region, to encounter the people there. And before going to the capital city, before meeting with the government representatives, he went to the indigenous peoples. So he's a man of uh, symbols. And this was very powerful. And we had a chance to be there. And Another element that was there, and people take it for granted, but it's really important in terms of how some elements of the structure are changing, at least from the perspective of the Pope and then from the periphery. But it was very touching to see the Pope sitting with the elders of the indigenous communities next to him and with those who have been impacted by extractive industries and the violence around the men and women around him. It was not the politicians, it was not the cardinals, it was not the priests. There was a clear sign, sign of what synodality meant uh, to the Pope and the process of the Amazon Synod. Then you had the indigenous nationalities, one after the other, in, such a, in, 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 in an expression of their own daily life, and way back there, the president of the country and the cardinals, and well, this, this place was full. So it was very important to see that the second element in that it was that the Pope did not come to talk and then leave and then left. He sat down 
to listen to the people. So her, first he heard the cries of the people, the denouncing, uh, the denounces of the peoples. Then he participated on their tradition and their spiritual life. And then after that, only then he spoke. That for me was really a clear orientation of what the synodal process was all about. For us as REPAM, uh, this network in which uh, Maria Angela and myself uh, took part of, before the Synod, as part of our pastoral conversion process, we um, organized meetings in the major basins, in the river basins of the Amazon, not countries, not groups, not parishes, not uh, ecclesiastical jurisdictions in the basins of the indigenous peoples. And we organized encounters of three, four days in which also the structure of it was to listen to the peoples, to participate on their spiritual life, to uh, somehow share with them. And only in the end, we would ask, what do you expect from the church? in terms of, of your reality, of your struggles and your hopes, so we can try to uh, be a part of your life. Of course, this is not a general experience, but it does leave a mark so much that the Synod, in a way, is also inspired by those dynamics, which, again, confirm what the Pope said, the peripheries become the center. The peripheries help transform the center. Maybe a final element on that is that uh, when then, so the Synod started in Rome, uh, sorry, in Puerto Maldonado, and for the assembly uh, stage of the Synod, the indigenous peoples came in, and it was beautiful and incredible, as you wouldn't imagine. Of course, it caused a lot of uh, reactions out there, but in St. Peter's, the indigenous peoples with their own spirituality, traditions, singing and dancing, they took St. Peter's uh, Basilic because it was their home. So it cannot only be a transformation of one side, it has to be reciprocal. So it was beautiful to see how they really felt part of it and how the Pope was embracing them. And we did a pilgrimage together and you see those photos, beautiful photos with the Pope surrounded by the indigenous peoples. That was not acting, it was truly the Pope receiving them now in their home. So final point, I remember when the Pope came for the first day and he was mad, he was angry. He was, clear, he was clearly angry and he said, I am hurt and angry because I heard some people around the, 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 the Vatican making fun of that indigenous people with his crown coming to me. And he said, could you tell me what is the difference with our own uh, vestments and tricornius? The difference is that we have an Eurocentric type of dynamic which rejects something which means exactly the same, which is offering the best of your identity to others. And we embrace our own because this is the best one. There is some structural racism in our uh, church dynamic. But maybe if I, if I can finish with the, the previous point, because it's connected with the dialogue, I agree with uh, Marianne, uh, Marianne's uh, points, but my own experience as a layman is also different because I too was excluded from voting. I too was excluded. We were the ones helping create the whole process of listening to the people, organizing the synod and we were excluded. So my own take on that was, we need to make this happen so the transformations actually take place, regardless of that, and we need to denounce those, those injustices, but truly we've taken some steps forward, and in, in my, my own experience, I, I didn't really, I didn't want to become something, because of course, the difference is that I didn't have a, women did not have a choice, they are excluded, because of their identity. I could have chosen to become a priest, but my, my lay identity, I embrace it as a plentiful identity, it's not a second identity. So I think it's also, this helps us also have an expanded vision of it. And it's not only one side or the other, but how we grow and take forward. But I, I agree that it takes too long, so we need to keep pushing. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I want to add to 
I, I was in, in the Amazon at the moment of the consultation, and I, in my humble way, I have the luck to participate, to be in the thematization. And I think, really, we arrived to a little community, sure, and we say, uh, well, thanks, missionary. Uh, so, sister, uh, you can speak. He said, no, no, um, we are here to listen. What? <laughs> so, what? The people cannot believe the church come to listen. And of course, the first thing when you ask is to listen the pain, was the hearts. And I know now a lot of connection, what I listen there and what I listen here eh? for the indigenous, from the indigenous people. So the, to be this minis and to be hard, well, so there are a lot of connection. And uh, for the dreams that the, were expressed in the Querida Amazonia, for instance, Oh, if you uh, read, sure, sure, you can dream uh, in, of Canada. I, want, I am going to quote Mauricio, <laughs> because I listen from you, one say, well, when we think in the Amazon and in the Synod, we can say, uh, what is the cry of the nature? What is the cry of the indigenous people? And what is the prophetic um, word of the church that is needed? And we can do that question here in Canada. I have an, some answer for myself, but all of you sure have answer to, to that question. Eh? Hmm. Thank you, Mary. I, I like that. What is the prophetic you know, voice or words that we are called to give? And, and not, none of us has the complete part of that, but many of us. Uh, I was struck by the dream of Francis around ecclesial renewal and what does that mean? What could that mean for, for Canada, for the Amazon, for the church and all its places? And I don't have the answers to that, and, uh, I, but I'm hungry for that and to see who has pieces of this prophetic voice. So let us keep listening. I'll just slip in a little piece that in indigenous work, one of I think the greatest starts is to try to learn some of the language, to appreciate the indigenous language enough to say, I would like to learn bits of it at least, because then we start by listening automatically. So anyway, my little interjection. I have a question uh, to either, all three of them. Uh, it's a very serious question. And as I, I have been a national leader, a local leader, grand chief, and regional ch vice chief, and I was with Ovid Mercury as the national chief. I was a vice chief. So I've been through the circles. One of the questions that I have for all three of you, and I'm, I'm a church people. I'm a preaching church people. I preach to my, uh, my, uh, my crowds. Last year, uh, before the COVID started, I was in 51 Indian communities in one season. That's from March till October. Cultural camps, youth camps, elder camps, uh, cer ceremonies, uh, sweat lodges, Sundance lodges, peyote meetings. I've been to, to a lot and churches, Catholic church, Anglican church, camp meeting, Christian church. I've been there. And I, I never exclude myself. I participate and I believe on who I'm going to go and talk to at that gathering. <laughs> and usually I get the answer. <laughs> I'm stubborn when it comes to asking. <laughs> My question is this, when is the church going to rescind the papal bulls, doctrine of discovery, bad word in the church? Nobody wants to talk about it, but I, I sure wish Pope, the Pope would listen to our plight with regard to those, to those doctrines. Those doctrines considered our pe people like me to be animals 
that can be enslaved, killed, raped, displaced, robbed, hurt, no rights to law, justice to land, no share in the wealth of our whole country, no share in the governance of the country, no invite to any legislature to discuss our home, our, the ho we are the hosts, we are the protectors of this land, no share in the land, no share in the economy, although we many, in many ways, uh, we, if the economy were as part of our, our uh, conversation, we would not be destroying what we have. We would not. So given no, uh, we were also give, not even given right to family. We lost the right to family. We lost the right to raise our children. We lost the right to teach our children our language, our culture. We lost the right to teaching our children the very foundation of our existence, our spirituality. So that's my question. How is the church going to approach the Pope to rescind the papal bulls, the doctrine of discovery? As you know, a lot of the legis legislative constitutional frameworks were based on top of the doctrine of discovery. That's a question. <laughs> and I wanted, to, I wanted to bring this out all evening, so. Uh, yep. When I was asked to be part of this discussion, I wanted to not waste your time, and I didn't want to waste my time either. I can go first on this one. Uh, it's not an easy, easy question either, AJ. And uh, I, I don't want to sound too simple, but the Our Lady of Guadalupe Circle did do a statement in 2016 on the doctrine of discovery and they gave some of the historical um, pieces of it and that the Vatican has rescinded it several times. But uh, the bad part is that it's gotten into especially American law and uh, has its effects in Canadian law too. And so that's the, the difficult part. And I'm not, I, I guess um, we look for ways of accompanying the indigenous people to express our um, uh, disgust with how the teachings got misused, I guess, in colonialism. So. Well, uh, it's, it's, <laughs> it's a, a question that is the whole, it's not a little question. Well, the statements are important, we need a reference, but we cannot uh, think, ah, I declare myself that I disagree with, and what more, no? I insist that we can do in the basic uh, that we are a lot of things. For me, uh, here in Edmonton, I am parisher, parishioner of the Sacred Heart of the First Nation in Paris. So what I need or why uh, I am there, no? Because I need to learn for indigenous people, and I think all of us, that we are a whole as being, not only mind. So <laughs> the Western culture, we listen from the mind and we don't move, almost <laughs> not move in the celebration. So it's, it's, it's to, to not be a whole being. So it's a part, and that is the most important part. Because no, <laughs> we are missing because we are disconnected of the nature, including our own nature. That wisdom is with the indigenous people. I want, I need, and I think as society, we need. So from my side, I also, my own belonging to this church, although it would be easy to say we've done some work trying to accompany the indigenous peoples to protect their rights or territories, and we've given our lives uh, on that front, 
I personally feel ashamed of that part of that history, but I cannot also move away from it. I try to embrace it as part of my own failures and try to redeem and transform my own life in that sense. I, yeah, we worked with the Jesuits to bring those letters to the Pope and the response that we got because we pushed hard from the Jesuits Conference of the uh, United States and Canada to Cardinal Cherney, who's a, a, a Canadian Jesuit, and, and, and we pushed forward with that and we had some uh, meetings discussing with some of the First Nations representatives from Canada, from, uh, from uh, the Sioux and uh, uh, some of the, 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 the communities and the response that we got, and I, it was not enough for me, of course, is that, as uh, Bishop Murray mentioned, that it had already been resigned, that it was not there, but uh, we were wondering why not making a serious, strong symbol to somehow uh, try to make amends with that, to ask for forgiveness. So that's one part. Now, on the other hand, my own experience, I was present in Bolivia when the Pope met with indigenous communities and the social movements, and he was very strong. If you go back to that speech, to his message, and, and he said, I ask for forgiveness for the sins committed by the church in the evangelization process, and we need to uh, transform that. So perhaps I can read just a small part of the official final document of the Synod, and we pushed and helped frame it, which says, we are all invited to approach the Amazon peoples on an equal footing, respecting their history, their cultures, their style of good living. Colonialism is the imposition of some people's ways of life on others, whether economically, culturally, or religiously. We reject a colonial style of evangelization. Proclaiming the good news of Jesus implies recognizing the seeds of the world already present in cultures. The evangelization that we propose today for the Amazon is an enculturated proclamation that generates intercultural processes, processes that promote the life of the church with an Amazonian faith and identity. Maybe my final word is that we conducted a number of meetings with indigenous peoples in preparation for the synod, not the Catholic, not only the Catholic indigenous peoples, with the political organizations of them. And I can say that it was a healing process. For three days, they could actually share what they felt. They feel the same about the Pope, but unfortunately, in many places, they don't feel the same from some of the uh, structures of our church and our representatives. So what I told them is that we need to bring that into the Senate. We promise we will bring your voice there. And this is what we got. The dream of the Pope of a non-colonial type of evangelization and the intercultural approach. I know it's not nearly enough, but at least I, I know that many, many of us try to, to go in that journey, hoping that eventually we will achieve that uh, interconnection because other, there, there's no other way to go about it and God's, uh, God has no limits. That's why Teilhard de Chardin, I didn't have a chance to, to talk about that, but this teaching from the indigenous peoples connected with that Teilhard says, we are not human beings having a spiritual experience. We are spiritual beings having a human experience. This changes everything. So I'd, I'd like to uh, really thank everyone. I was going to ask as the last question, um, I'm up, we're over time, but that's fine. Uh, what is the lasting direction of the Synod? But I think we had an answer to that question um, in all these bits and also the questions that we haven't got into. I think the panelists have given us uh, ways to address those, to find the sacred in front of us, to look for the connections that would uh, foster more concrete activism etc. So I just would like to sincerely thank you. I think you've given us all um, very, very nourishing ideas um, related to a variety of points, um, including the, the answers that we just heard that are the cogent issues for a lot of people. How do we foster this cross-cultural encounter? How do we find um, and transform roles within the church um, so that they recognize that the true contributions 
of women and how do we deal with this um, legacy of colonialism, of settler colonialism and, and work on indigenous settler solidarity. Um, so without, uh, so with that, I just uh, hand it over to Sarah, who has a couple of technical things um, to mention. I'll let you know that we're working as a committee um, on discerning a way forward for our last uh, webinar, which will be around um, the second half of June. Um, and we will take what we've heard today, we'll reflect on it, and we'll, and we'll bring forward, I think, an important format to continue this process of uh, understanding the Amazonian perspective and grounding that in the Canadian context. So over to Sarah. Thanks, Chris. And on behalf of all of us, I sincerely thank all of the speakers who've been with us uh, tonight and for all of you for joining us for such a rich evening of learning and discussion. A recording, uh, a link to the recording of this event uh, will be emailed to you in the next few days and it will be available for you to view in the coming year. Uh, the link will also be available to anyone who is not able to join us tonight on the YouTube channel, um, a part of the website of the Roman Catholic Diocese of Saskatoon. So if you go to that uh, website, you'll be able to see the link and Myron's going to be getting that up in the next little while. We invite everyone to consider making a special Lenten donation to development and peace as a way to continue to build solidarity between Canada and the people of the Amazon region. So I am going to keep this Zoom link open for those who would like to continue this conversation or enjoy visiting with each other. And I am ending the recording now. Thank you again to all of you and good night. Thank you very much. Good night. Oh, okay. I opened it. Thank you. Thank you.